Coming up next on News Depth, bigger classrooms are being built in Spain to help students social distance. And wildfires are burning through multiple states on the West Coast. How are farmers in Colorado dealing with weird weather? We'll find that out. Plus, we head underwater with an awesome photographer. News Depth is now. Wildfires are whipping through the West. Hello everybody, I'm Rick Jackson. Thank you for joining us. California, Oregon, and Washington are all facing huge fires. More than 3 million acres have burned in California, and we're not even close to the end of wildfire season, which extends into November. The August Complex fire has been particularly damaging, though. Burning through more than 877,000 acres, it's now the largest California wildfire in history. The fire is the result of multiple other fires combining into one. Many of those original fires were caused by lightning. According to CAL FIRE, nearly 17,000 firefighters have been called on to battle the blazes, but authorities say Mother Nature is not making it easy. Record temperatures, high temperatures, uh, low humidity, uh, dynamic wind conditions, and the drought of all uh, combined to make this one of the most challenging, perhaps the most challenging wildfire season California's ever seen. In particular, Santa Ana winds may make fighting fires in California more difficult. The Santa Ana winds are strong, dry winds that blow from inland deserts across Southern California. The air heats up and dries as it pushes down and out toward the coast. Reporter Jared Aaron spoke with firefighters on the front lines of the Valley Fire as they watched for the winds in Alpine, California. Jared? Yeah, perfect. We're, we gotta move that over to... Cal Fire spent days planning, mapping, preparing, I copy. Break. For a moment like this. It is tense. We've been concerned about this. With Santa Ana winds in the forecast, any spot fire could quickly spread. When one flared up Wednesday morning near Loveland Reservoir, crews were ready. We're going to bring aircraft in, some uh, air tankers and some helicopters, start dropping, keep it in check till we can get the crews up there, and they can cut that out and try and pick it up. Three helicopters doused the fire repeatedly keeping it contained. Uh, we're monitoring the fire. When we see it start to pooch out like it is now, we're going to jump on it and get it. Cal Fire says more than 500 firefighters are assigned to the Valley Fire Wednesday. Many were strategically placed, watching and waiting to respond. The wind stayed relatively calm, helping the fight. We'll just keep plugging away and hopefully the weather will cooperate with us and that'll be a good success. Thanks, Jared. Thousands of people have been evacuated from their homes, but not just in California. Besides the fires there, there are fires in Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. More than one million acres have burned in Oregon alone, and in Washington state, more than half a million acres. The small town of Malden, Washington, was almost completely decimated in a matter of hours last week. Officials in the area used loudspeakers to warn residents to evacuate as quickly as possible. Among those heading to safety was resident Tim Wisenand. He told reporter Mar Kawash that while he lost his house to the fire, he learned what is truly important to him. Mahar was there when Tim returned to see what was left of his home. We often see wildfires and other natural disasters strike and never expect them to happen to us. This was my front room. There's my oven. My cast iron, you know, wood burning oven. Last I'm night, up here. it did and happen to Tim Wissanan. Today, we walked with him on the land his house used to stand on. Trees. I guess this one fell over, blew up something. It's crazy. I don't know. I've never seen anything burn like that. As he takes in the damage, he sees his bike, front porch, and kitchen all burned into the same pile of ash. But in these moments, we realize the things that we think are important often aren't. What used to be a kitchen. That's right. Uh... That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is I, I could have made better decisions on what I grabbed. He wishes there was more time to grab those irreplaceable mementos. He spent decades working internationally as a teacher. Now the photos and souvenirs from those experiences burnt to ash. And I didn't realize how fast the fire would get here. And uh, so they're gone. Wisenand is now staying at a nearby hotel for the time being, trying to stay positive in a time of despair. You like roasted apples? <laughs> he believes he'll have the means to rebuild and hopefully keep living in the Malden area. 
something not every homeowner will be able to do. Thanks, Mahar. Wow, what an important lesson about what's truly important in life. Now, even here in Ohio, we saw a bit of smoke from all those fires. Take a look at this tweet from the National Weather Service. The satellite image shows the difference between low clouds coming off of Lake Erie and wildfire smoke that sits higher in the sky. Now, if wildfires and hot temperatures weren't enough to deal with, in Colorado, the state faced a cold snap, too. Last week, they experienced sweltering heat one day and snow the next. More than swapping out flip-flops for fluffy coats, the dramatic change in weathers had serious impact on farmers. Reporter Mark Salinger headed to a farm in Brighton, Colorado, to see how folks there prepared for the sudden temperature drop. It is interesting to be working through record heat to prepare for record cold. <laughs> on days like today, it's hard to imagine the change that's coming. Oh, Lord, please, no. <laughs> that's what went through my mind. Um, and then you start mentally trying to prepare. Claudia Farrell has learned a thing or two about heartbreak this year. I grieve. I grieve. She grieved when the hail destroyed her melons. She grieved when the drought hurt her flowers. Now she's preparing to grieve again. That's my passion is to grow this stuff for people to eat. And to see beautiful things destroyed is really painful. On a day when the crops wilted under the afternoon heat. There's a lot to do. Yeah, there is. Around these parts of Berry Patch Farms in Brighton, the preparations began for a day much colder. I knew there was a huge cold front dropping down, but you just aren't necessarily expecting this much cold. You kind of wish those Canadians would keep it to themselves, but <laughs> they're not. On Monday, it'll be in the 90s. On Tuesday, it'll be in the 30s. While snow in September may be fun for some, for Claudia, it brings more heartache. It's concerning about the potential losses. It's concerning about your potential future, your ability to carry on. You've had two huge hits like this. Today, she spent her afternoon picking okra. There's no chance that'll survive the freeze. She worries what else could die with it. Well, on Tuesday, what can happen is that the potential is to lose everything. For now, she saves what she can. All you do is you try. You have to try. Preparing for the day when sun turns to snow. In Brighton, I'm Mark Salinger. Thanks, Mark. The National Weather Service said quick drops in temperatures can be bad for outside animals, too. They advised farmers to look out for their cattle in advance of the chill. Now, for this week's poll, we want you to play the role of weatherman or weather woman. Have you observed an increase in unusual weather where you live? You can vote either yes or no. You can find a link to the poll beneath this episode online or click the poll button on the News Depth homepage. Come to think of it, we did get a lot of rain last week that I wasn't expecting. Well, why don't we pause to check the results from last week's poll while we're talking poll. We ask you how you would prefer for school to be right now. 49% of you said you'd like to have classes in person at school. Of course, you aren't the only students facing a rather unusual school year. Across the globe, other countries are also figuring out how to make learning happen. Take Spain, for example. Hola! This country in Western Europe takes up most of the Iberian Peninsula, bordered by the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. A peninsula is a landform that's surrounded by water on multiple sides, but is still connected to the mainland. About 48 million people live in Spain, which is a constitutional monarchy. That means they have a king and a set of guiding rules, too. The capital city, Madrid, is home to world-famous paintings and a mix of unique architecture. But aside from flamenco dancing and a midday siesta, educators in Spain are working on getting buildings ready for the new school year. Atika Schubert visited public schools and private schools to see how they're addressing the pandemic. Atika? The British Council School of Madrid is hammering out new facilities to meet COVID-19 guidelines for the start of a new school year like no other. So we'll Head of school Mercedes Hernandez shows us the breezy new cafeteria extension. Yeah, yeah, I indoor outdoor areas for smaller classes with better ventilation. And the playground is now a rainbow colored labyrinth of dividers to keep classes in their bubbles to prevent the virus from spreading. She's also ordered six mobile classrooms like this to arrive before school starts. Technology uh, and a large campus and the beautiful Spanish weather uh, gives us the option of learning in many different spaces in, in different ways. 
Maku is our head nurse. The school has already hired more teachers, schoolminders, and nurses, but there is a stark difference between Madrid's private schools that have the means to deliver safe classrooms and the bleak public schools across town. The virus is spreading fastest in the poorest areas of Madrid, but public schools here simply do not have the resources to add more space, more classes, or more teachers. Now, the government has finally promised to fast-track more funds. Even so, little of that is going to be ready before school start in just a few days' time. At the end of August, the Madrid government finally earmarked 370 million euros for COVID-19 measures, promising to hire 11,000 new teachers. Mari Carmen Morias of the National Parents Association is angry that it took so long. She has four kids of her own and one computer that they all fought over at the peak of the pandemic. She says her school needs four more teachers whose budget has yet to be approved. She's worried that if the classes can't open safely, public schools will go back online, lagging far behind their wealthy peers. What is absolutely necessary, she says, is financial investment. Teachers need to be hired now, from day one, not after weeks and weeks of waiting. And she adds, a screen does not substitute for school. Two schools, worlds apart. For Spain's youngest, COVID-19 threatens to widen that gap even more. Atika Schubert, Madrid. Thanks, Atika. Schools with larger buildings, students wearing masks, classes online. This is certainly a year for the history books and probably for a little extra help, too. It's not easy having classes switched up, whether you're back in the classroom or at home on the computer. That's why some folks in Missouri decided to open up community centers to help kids with homework and give them an extra place to have a little fun despite the pandemic. Reporter Cody Holyoke takes us there. It's the first day of the new year and kids are ready to go. Those are your assignments that are due today. Lesson number one, their community is here to help. Children need this support. The folks with Casey Parks understand 2020 is different. They're here to lend a hand, opening up four community centers for free to KCPS students who need a place to learn. But it's more than that. Kids can take the bus to and from the centers, eat meals when they're there, and have fun with friends. Community partners even offer before and after school care. There is a a social aspect that we've all kind of been lacking as we're staying at home and just trying to be distant from one another and I think that's really affecting children. Other community groups offer similar support. Some 900 kids are signed up for a learning academy program offered by the YMCA of Greater Kansas City. We understand that there's an education equity gap and we want to try to help do our part to fill that equity gap. While we're not trying to mimic what a school is, some of the best components of school can still be found in the program that we'll provide. Schools across the metro have signed on as families struggle to reap the benefits of in-person learning and activities in an ever-increasingly virtual world. Thank you, Cody. Okay, I think we've talked about other schools long enough. Time to hear about yours. Because we asked you last week to design a flag that symbolizes your school and then explain your design for us. Let's see what you came up with by opening up our inbox. Sam from Summit Virtual Academy sent in this design. I would make a flag of a computer with the words stay safe in bold letters on the top. The flag would be blue and the computer would be in the middle with a COVID mask on the screen of the computer and the mask would have a red heart in the middle. I think this is because we need to keep our love strong, even though it may be tough. Stay safe. We'll make it through this together. Good sentiments. Mariah from Winesburg Elementary in Winesburg wrote, I would make mine yellow because there's a lot of corn where we live. Then in the middle, a gray circle for how beautiful our moon is. Then through the circle, a blue line for the horizon. Then in the circle, a rainbow for how pretty our rainbows are. That would be our flag for Winesburg. Here's one from Olivia at Elmhurst Elementary in Toledo. I think we should have a rectangle shaped flag. I think the corners of the flag should be red and vertical dark and light gray stripes. The colors on our flag are our school colors. Across the stripe should be in black print the word Bulldogs with a small paw print at the end of the word. This represents our school mascot. I think this flag would fit and represent our school well. Maya from Rushwood Elementary in Sagamore Hills got pretty creative as well. I use the color green and white because it is the school's colors. I also put an N because that's the symbol of Nordonia schools. I put respectful, responsible, and ready to learn because that is what they say in the announcements every day in the morning. 
And finally, Madeline from Mulberry Elementary in Milford. I designed an eagle because we are the Milford Eagles. That is also our school mascot. I put an M for Mulberry behind the eagle as well. Then I put the rest of the word in small letters next to it. Wow, great job everyone. I mean, really great job. Some pretty creative designs too. We've got some great pictures of a few of you holding up your flags too, which is really sweet. Thank you for that. While we are able to share your letters to have a photo or a video of you included, we need to have your parents' permission. So teachers, you can find a media release and more information on this beneath the inbox form online. Now this week's question is going to let you use some more imagination, but we've got a few more stories before that, so let's dive back into the news. Literally dive back, because divers in Vermont recently got a close-up view of maritime history down in the dark waters of Lake Champlain. Maritime means related to the sea, especially when it comes to military action. Remains from one of the oldest steamship wrecks in the world have been resting at the bottom of that lake since 1819. Ross Ketchke has details. About 200 feet below the surface of Lake Champlain, divers getting their hands on a newfound piece of history. There's anchors, there's pieces of ship that are down there, but nothing is intact the way these things are intact. In late August, Gary Lefebvre and his wife set off on their research boat in Colchester. The couple has used their radar to ping thousands of targets at the bottom of the lake to explore. But this trip turning up something extra special. I had no idea there was anything left of this thing. Through the camera of a remote dive vehicle, Lefebvre laying eyes on a pair of paddle wheels, soon learning they came from the infamous Phoenix steamboat fire, preserved in the cold, dark water for the last two centuries. To have it attached to a very specific and well-known event in the lake's history is just even that more, you know, unusual and rare. The Phoenix was an early model steamship built in nearby Virgins to ferry passengers and cargo around the lake. But in September 1819, flames tore through the vessel, forcing all on board to abandon ship, six people losing their lives in the water. It's considered one of the greatest tragedies in the lake's history and one of the oldest steamship wrecks in the world. It's the evidence of the charring on these paddle wheel structures that are very evocative of the intensity and the speed of the fire. It's the kind of discovery that reignites the imagination of Lefebvre and his fellow explorers. Now ready to fill in more of the Phoenix's history with his long lost puzzle piece. When you see something like this that's been down there for that many years, that's going to tie this whole story together in a better in a better vision. It's, it's just incredible to look at. Thanks, Ross. The wheels were located roughly a mile from the ship's main hull, which is a popular scuba destination. Lake Champlain Maritime Museum's Director of Research and Archaeology says the paddle wheels will likely be left right where they are for further study. Besides, it would be pretty difficult to bring them to the surface. More underwater discoveries are the focus of artist Stephen Frank. Every once in a while this season, we're going to be bringing you stories about arts in a segment we call Sketchbook. In this week's Sketchbook, pay attention to Frank's process of composing a photo. Composition is an art term meaning the arrangement of elements in a piece of art. All right, let's check it out. I can't tell you how many queen angelfish I've photographed over the years, but this is the one that, of all of them, resonates more. Um, and I think it's, it, it is because the fish has personality. My name is Stephen Frank. I'm an underwater photographer from Key Largo, Florida. I travel the world for underwater photography, but this is my hometown. I'm also the publisher of Alert Diver magazine. The fish was just turning into me, and I, I had a 100 millimeter macro lens on it, and you know it, it was able to lock into focus. And the eye contact is, is, is really good too. It's not like I had to chase this animal. I was there, he came to me, we had a moment, and he was gone. For marine life photography, I think proximity is one of the most important things. And I think you have to be able to project a benign presence. You have to approach the animal in a, in a fashion so they're not threatened. So that means not moving too fast so that you don't push a big uh, force field of water. They have to believe in you. And we also have to think, know a little bit about the behavior so that we know that a butterfly fish, for example, is probably going to be looking for a little crevice to find little crustaceans and things of that nature. If you know a little bit about the fish, you can predict where they may be and you can place yourself in that position. I think I spent many years looking at the photography of other people and looking at the composition and uh, think, you know, how, how do they do that? 
so long as you have, a, I think, a, a good camera and, and good lights, because color doesn't really exist underwater in the absence of artificial light, once you have the tools, you can get a serviceable photograph. I think what, what transcends a serviceable photograph in, into art is composition and the eye of the artist. It's exciting. I, if, if it were not for underwater photography, I wouldn't be a diver today because I'd be bored. But I'm never ever bored diving because even though it's a, I don't know, let's say a French angel and I've shot 12,000 French angel, angel fish in my life, this one's different. But there's still really, really inspiring things. Thanks to our friends at WPBT, South Florida's PBS station, for that pretty neat story. Okay, if you thought Stephen was impressive, you're going to really like this next story about a, get this, 100-year-old scuba diver. He's breaking the world record for being the oldest diver. Reporter William Engels has that story from Illinois. It's a special day at Pearl Lake in South Beloit. Not because it's Labor Day. Rather, there's history taking place beneath the surface. And I said, you know, Bill, you could be the oldest diver in the world you want to go for it? He says, yeah, he says, let's go for it. At 100 years young, Bill Lambert dove into the record books for the third time since he started scuba diving. That feat is even more impressive considering Lambert didn't even start diving until he was 98. It's something that even Lambert's daughter still struggles to wrap her head around. Every step of the way, it was like, what, what? And he goes, yeah, I'm going to go to Cozumel. And they're like, what? <laughs> so it's been, it's been pretty insane, yeah. And the fact that he's still doing it and he's still healthy enough to do it at 100. Um, he is an amazing guy. Lambert's diving instructor Danny Johnson of Loves Park Scuba says that scuba diving is a great exercise for seniors. Uh, it, it helps them make them feel good. The water is good for us. The exercising in the water is really good for circulation. And while Lambert would love for everyone to try scuba diving, he hopes his story inspires people to try new things more often. They should try it. If they like it, pursue it or anything. In the meantime, Lambert's next pursuit is clear. Is it, we'll do 100, one and make, break it again. <laughs> Living life to the fullest and making history while doing it. Thanks, William. I love that Bill started learning to scuba dive only two years ago. Proves you're never too old to learn something new. Now for this week's inbox question, we want you to dream big, like Bill. Write to us and tell us what you would like to do when you're 100 years old. For this week's a award winners, I bet their answers would have something to do with being on a boat. Does spending five hours on a boat braving the waves and the rain sound like fun to you? Well, what if it was for a good cause? This week's News Depth a goes to 12 student sailors from Bay Village, Avon Lake, and Sandusky, Ohio. They raised more than $25,000 for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society by participating in the Leukemia Cup Regatta in Sandusky. The idea of entering student sailors in the traditionally adult regatta was the brainchild of Brett and Katie Langolf of Bexley, who sail with their daughters, 12-year-old Hadley and 10-year-old Charlotte, in the Sandusky Sailing Club. Their nonprofit, More Kids on Sailboats, aims to get children of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities out on the water to learn the sport of sailing, teamwork, and leadership skills as well. In addition to their daughters, 10 other youth sailors entered the charitable 25-mile race, which started just off of Cedar Point Beach and circled Kelly's Island. After just four team practices, Bay High School sailor Jack Vanderhorst skippered the 34-foot sailboat through large waves and strong winds, including gusts of over 30 miles an hour. Several boats retired from the race before it even got started because of the weather. We were getting pounded, he writes, with waves every few seconds. That's from Jonathan Mack, also of Bay High. Right beside Jonathan in the bow of the boat for the grueling five-hour race was Bay 7th grader Molly Keene, a leukemia survivor, making the team's finish and donation to the charity even more meaningful. Molly's mother, Kate Keene, proudly reported these kids came in a very respectable sixth place, but the lessons they learned and the LLS donation they made are both life-changing. The crew also included Bay Village sailors Robbie Mansueto, Ellen Petrigan, Anika Vanderhorst, and Kelly Keene, as well as Alex Schock of Sandusky and Chad and Olivia Schaffner of Avon Lake. You may have been sixth in the race, but you guys are first in our book, okay? We're proud to award this week's News Depth a awards to these sailors for raising money for cancer research. Now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Drum roll, please. Let's see what Newscat has pot up for this week's petting zoo. Meow. 
Oh, newscast, sometimes you can be such a couch potato. That's better, get up. Oh, look at those paws go. Ah, she found a story about a pot belly pig party, really? Looks like the Alaska pot belly pig rescue is holding its annual adoption celebration. To find out more about these oinkers, click the petting zoo button on our website. Oinkers, you like that part? Thank you, Newscat. All right, before I sign off, a reminder to teachers to sign up for our new weekly e-newsletter. We'll let you know what to expect in the upcoming episode, link up learning standards with weekly stories, and share the episode's worksheet as well. You can find the form to sign up right on the NewsDepth homepage. As a thank you, we'll be sending out this year's NewsCat poster. If you're already signed up, don't worry, we'll make sure that you get one too. Okay. That's it for me, except to say there are plenty of ways to stay in touch. You can write to us. We're at 1375 Euclid Avenue, Cleveland, Ohio. Our zip code's 44115. You can email us, newsdep at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. Our handle is at newsdepthohio. Plus, you can catch all of our special segments on YouTube. And if you're old enough, kids, go ahead and hit subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our new videos. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Jackson. We'll see you right back here next week. New Steps is made possible by a grant from the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation.